Today, I am joined by Denise Champagne, a speaker, coach, mentor, and consultant who specializes in helping salespeople bring their value up into the C-suite. We talk a lot about the current state of the sales process, what the sales world looks like post-COVID, and we spend a ton of time talking about how if you're in the job market, if you're searching for a new position, how no matter what your role, it is a sales job. So without further ado, here we go. Here I go, ready now, I'm coming for you, can't nothing stop me, I got some things I gotta do, hey, 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 I'm making a move, study Denise, my friend, thank you so much for being on the show today, very excited to, um, to talk with you, I, I know you've got a lot of great advice for, uh, for people about how to, how to be the best person that they can possibly be. Uh, a lot of great advice for salespeople, but I think we're going to talk a little bit about how this advice for salespeople isn't just for salespeople. It's for everybody in almost any capacity to uh, do the best work that they're capable of. Uh, so, Denny, please uh, give us a quick intro about uh, about who you are, the experiences you've had, and, and um, <laughs> frankly, why people should uh, listen to you and, and heed some of the advice that you've got. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation, uh, Travis. This is a, an honor, you know, because I followed you a little bit as well. And I see the, the integrity of your work and the caring that you bring to the table. Uh, so I, you know, I'm self-employed for 30 years. I owned a call center for 10 of those years, managed one three or four years before that in the 80s. So that tells you a little bit my age. Uh, former pro athlete as well in racket sports, a coach and an athlete in two sports, cycling, as a master's elite in track and road and a racket sports athlete for 15 years. And um, in the last, uh, I guess, 15, 16 years, I spent more time just prospecting the C-suite. Uh, companies would hire me on a by mandate basis to open the doors, to engage correctly with the C-suite where the decisions are made, to uh, allow some um, you know, uh, discussions and engagement with clients in various space, spaces mostly tech, some other in energy efficiency and agro-food, but mostly tech. And uh, now I've converted all that know-how and activity knowledge, as I call, and I want to give it back to those who want to improve and become more mature, relevant and stuff, like just coaching them and training them. And I'm also a consultant in sales enablement with, uh, as a partner with salesiqglobal.com. So when you're when someone brings you on to to coach them, uh, what are they bringing you on for? Mostly prospecting. The reason why? Because it's the biggest weakness in all companies. Uh, the reason why most salespeople do not meet their numbers every year, it's not because they're not capable of uh, having product knowledge or understand some of the problems. It just they don't reach out and consistently create quality pipeline. It's why, is that simple such a big, as, why is that such a big challenge for people? Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting question. That's an inter, uh, well, it's a, a, a good and important question. Uh, I met with the uh, daughter of, a, of, of, a, of an author, uh, Dr. Dudley, who wrote a book called Sales Call, or Sales Call Reluctance, called mm -hmm. Relent, Relentless. And he has created a modeling uh, and archetypes to establish why people do things. But very common sense, people are, are afraid of getting refused. And notice I didn't say rejected, because that's another semantic discussion we could have a whole show on, uh, why people uh, don't know how to, I guess, associate themselves with the idea of rejection versus refusal. I don't get rejected. I don't feel rejected when someone says no to me. He just says he's just refusing the proposal or the offer or the discussion, right? It's not, he doesn't know me enough to reach. I don't feel rejected. Mm -hmm. So it takes a good deep understanding of who you are. Uh, and um, so it's a good question. Why they don't prospect often. They don't know how, hmm. or they haven't thought through how to reach the people. They don't have enough empathy to really put themselves in the position of a C-suite. They haven't interviewed any C-suite member. And say, how do you guys like to be approached? I've done that. I asked executives, how do you like to be approached? What is it that matters to you? 
and then do that. Well, I, I love the idea of shifting the mindset of it's, it's a refusal, not a rejection. And I've spent most of my prospecting career in uh, recruiting. And when, when I started, it was, I felt that rejection deeply and personally. Yeah, of but course. Then, but then I don't know what happened. I, don't, I think it was one specific conversation where I realized I almost never have somebody say, no, not now, not ever. If I listened closely, they were usually saying, now is not the right time, which is fine because as a salesperson, you have the ability to bring value to uh, most every one of your potential customers when the timing is right. But the timing ain't always right to me. It, it's not. And so by shifting that mindset to no, not now, I'm able to em embrace that and continue with that, ref to build on that um, prospect's refusal and still develop a relationship for potential new business sometime. And I think, I think to your point, a lot of salespeople, they hear, no, not now, not ever. Well, there's two points there that are really good. I'm glad you bring it up that way because there's one way of looking at it and saying um, <clears throat> that uh, no has many, uh, you know, phonetically, so no, you can hear the word N-O. But what I hear is K-N-O-W, I don't know enough. Tell me more. So, and maybe not right now, N-O-W. So you just N-O and you put the W in parenthetically. And it's another no, not now, not, but it's I don't know enough and I don't need to know enough right now, but let's stay in touch and later you can tell me more so I'll know more. <laughs> so that's one way of, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, interpreting it. And t about timing, um, there's a gentleman who in the TED show or a TED recording talked about his 40 years of investments in startups. Mm -hmm. And he said, of all the variables and the factors that affected his best decisions was timing. Mm -hmm. Timing is what an investor, like YouTube, I, I have a dear friend who's a mentor to me, who's personal friends with the owners of YouTube. And they even said, we didn't really have, we weren't geniuses. We just knew how to embed video quickly out of codec on the web so that people themselves can quickly embed their videos. We were just there at the right time. So you call people and you call them at the right time. I've been successful in that. And with others that it, the timing is not right. Oh, okay. So you understand it's not the right timing, but let's connect as people connect as people, right? We both have all the same sufferings. We're going to go through the same tribulations and trials in our lives, you know, the common ones, you know, of sickness and old age and death and all that stuff. But we share common ground. If I'm calling you, is there something in common with each other? So I'm happy. I'm so happy to meet a new person. And, uh, you know, I coach people to nurture that kind of feeling. Oh, I can't wait to meet someone new. And if you get up every morning and says, who am I going to meet new today? That helps you to move daily in your, uh, you know, your quest. Yeah. And I think it's important for uh, job seekers to hear that message too, because when I think a lot of times when uh, a person interviews with a company and they don't get the job that they're interviewing for, they are heartbroken. And I, I get that. It's, it, it can be heartbreaking to be rejected, but are they being rejected or are they just being refused at this current time for this current job? And I, I, I want candidates to hear, and I hope they, they hear that if there's a company that they're passionate about, if there's a company they're excited about working for, if they can find an organization that's doing good and they think they can bring value to, even if they don't get the job that they're working for right now, I think that should be okay for them. Disappointing, yes, but if they're passionate about that company and they continue to engage and interact with the people in that organization on a professional basis, bringing value to them even when they're not working for them, someday they're going to work for that company if they're truly excited about that organization. 
It's Absolutely. Expensive. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I learned earlier on in the 80s when I was managing this telemarketing company and transactional office products that we used to sell coast to coast uh, in Toronto. And um, there were uh, 30 to 35 agents selling with watch lines at the time, you know, which means, you know, across, you know, wide area trend telephone services, WATS. Mm -hmm. So I had people in the time zone of the Pacific with Vancouver, and we had people in the East Coast, you know, uh, early in the morning or late in the, in the afternoon. And, um, you know, many years later, I, I moved to Montreal. And as, as, like I said, I was a pro athlete in squash when I was coaching the McGill University intercollegiate team, and I was at the banquet for awards. And who do I find? One of the people that worked in that room eight or nine years later, and he says, hey, finally I find you. I, what do you mean? He says, I have an office here, and I had heard that you had moved to Montreal, and I remember how you worked in the office back then, and, uh, and we became partners for 10 years in a company. Wow. So you never know who's watching you, and they notice things about you. So stay conscious. Be aware of everything you do creates a cause and creates an effect right? Oh, and that goes back to the, the importance of, you know, meeting somebody new every day and continuing to be present with your network because um, it's very fortuitous that you two happen to find each other at this awards ceremony, but that's a happy accident, my friend. And if you and or he at the time had been uh, it sounds like a bit more focused on engaging with your network. He could have been sure that he had found you or you could have been a lot easier to find as opposed to just a coincidence of being in the same room at the same time. Well, that depends if your philosophy is that you understand that causality is a law that is always at work, no differently than gravity. Talk to me more about that. What do you mean by that? Well, cause and effect is the basic functional principle that operates in the universe. You know, our thoughts, our words, our deeds do have an impact on ourself and those around us. Our self and the environment is not separated. You are part of the environment, so you do have an impact. Although, be it, albeit, you know, maybe minor in your perception because you don't understand the greatness of who you are and how you can impact people. When I, uh, if I, if I, uh, you know, don't say I don't believe in the law of gravity and I throw myself off a building, I'll fall anyway, <laughs> right? Because the law exists. The law of cause and effect is at work at every moment. But we don't, we're not, I guess, sensitized to it. You know, to take consciousness on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is a, a hard job. But if you keep, um, um, if you care enough, if you care enough about your effects and you take, you know, kind of a consciousness of the causality as a law, you'll probably cause better effects in the future. And it takes conscious daily practice. You know, my, my Buddhist practice teaches me that, right? Cause and effect is at work every moment. You know, and I know that sometimes I create bad effects. I know it. But I'm because I'm aware of it and I, I work towards transforming myself, you know, what I say on these podcasts, what I do in the, what I call in the, in the, in the, the shadow, one-on-one -on -one with sales reps that I coach individually, they do mean, they, they do mean something in the overall scheme of my own life. So you can't hide from yourself, even though people won't notice it, but you know it and you know that you've created a cause that's not that and it does have an impact a lot of people are speakers they're wonderful you hear them speak on stage you get close to them and they're not even nice to you hmm. but they appear nice on stage but they'll if you ask them they may say i can't stand people but they're wonder they sound wonderful right so the congruency between that which you are really and what you put out there um, it's, it's about alignment. It's about congruency with self. And it, it, it takes, um, 
observing yourself, like really be honest. Like I went through something in the last couple of days and I was really sad personally. I won't get into details, but then I had to stop and say, okay, the impact I have on that person. And I had to make a decision one more day of, of uh, clemency towards myself first and towards that person. And I, I changed my, my view of things by, by my prayer and just, you know, be, that, that's me now. I'm not, you know, here proselytizing or anything, but just my own life, right? It's important to me. But it's an introspection. It's an observation of your own heart. Uh, in sales, you have to do the same thing. When you're uh, going for a job, you, you come with, your, with you who you are. And if they can't accept that, then you have to say, well, it's their loss for now. It's not now, like you said, right? right. Yep. Well, and I think, uh, you know, they hire, they hire the self. Uh, at least, at least I, I, I think that the great companies do. The great companies will go out and they will hire, hire the best person and not the best resume. And that, is, that is something that is, is much harder to do. And, and I'd imagine that you do a lot of coaching with sales with salespeople and other professionals about to how to present their best self. Because if you're going against, uh, if you're applying for a position and the company is only looking at, they're going to hire the person whose resume best matches the job description. You don't have much of a shot at beating out somebody who has a better resume, has more applicable experience. But if a company is focused on finding the best self. Uh, somebody has the minimum expectations to be adequate at the job, but then they can focus on hiring the, the best person to build and enhance that company's being, that company's culture. Those are the companies that are going to find the people that can best help them thrive. I think it sounds like you do a lot of work on uh, helping people present them their best selves and understanding their best self. Correct. And especially with the C-suite, actually, to that point, C-suite are really trying to pick out your bullshit. Mm -hmm. They can tell if you're trying to be something that you're not. So I talk about three things, character, integrity, and spirit. So your character is who you are deeply that, you know, resonates and the depth of, uh, you know, in the water, when you see a river or a lake, you see on the top of the water, you see a lot of the waves, right? But under the water, there's a lot of currents, different mm -hmm. currents. That is the inner nature of who you are. And that takes a lot of work to transform that. Your integrity, um, uh, what's his, uh, the wealth, uh, uh, what's it? Berkshire, Berkshire, uh, what's the company, the wealthy man? Um, I had his name a few minutes ago. Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett took Dale Carnegie. I, I was nine times graduate assistant also in Dale Carnegie courses over 30 years. Uh, so Dale, I go back the old school with Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. And so integrity, he says, if they have character, they have, you know, willingness to work and integrity, and they don't have the last one, doesn't matter of the first two. So if they don't have integrity, forget it. So integrity character and spirit uh, in the book, Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. There's a chapter where he talks about what is your QQS rating? <coughs> quality, right? The quality of your work you do. So it was about, you know, establishing your value, your personal value of marketing services in the marketplace. Like what's a, the, the benchmark that they attach to you financially or otherwise? So the Q is the quality of your work, then the quantity of your work. But what actually differentiates or makes you stand out from the rest is the spirit with which you render the service. And I've been hired and I've been, you know, retained by some, some clients of mine because of my spirit of service, my spirit of really wanting to do a good job for them. And they say, yeah, you're... We can tell that you want to help us, you know, you care. So that's more important sometimes, you know, because they'll learn how to do things. We can teach them that. But what we can't teach them is the heart and the spirit of integrity and character. That is what 
you are, right? You can change through suffering, but not on my account, balance, bank account, or not on my clock, right? That's what employee, you say, fine, you, you can learn. Go learn somewhere else. You know, we want someone who's ready by way of spirit, of character, of integrity. It's a lot easier to teach the, uh, the hard and technical skills than it is those, uh, those softer skills. I remember you mentioning that when we had a discussion prior. That's why I'm mentioning it because it's so bloody true. Yep. Right? yep. Well, I've heard you say before too that great salespeople are great human beings. Yeah. And it's so incredibly important because people are good at reading bullshit. And you said it, especially high level executives. I think a lot of them get there because they're good at spotting bullshit. And if somebody will do anything to shove a product in someone's face and get them to buy it no matter what, well, that is not a recipe for um, increased and sustained business relationships. That's somebody that they're going to buy it once and they're going to be pissed. But if you understand the value that you can provide as as a business person, understanding the value you can provide to a company means you got to have the ability to understand that the value you can provide isn't always going to be valuable to everybody. There's a right time and a right place for the value you can provide. And it goes, it goes back to the, it's good salespeople are, are great at accepting refusal. Bad salespeople, bad salespeople do a good job at overcoming rejection. <laughs> yeah, that's a semantic hair split there, but nonetheless, yes. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, but it's fun. We have to, you know, people want to hear this podcast and, and, and say, hey, there's a stimulating exchange there that uh, causes them also to think about what, what is important to me, right? We're on a discovery on this earth, you know, during this lifetime. We're, we're discovering ourselves. We are uncovering things that we didn't know had there or, yeah, it's a wonderful discovery. It's a, it's a, it's a long, pro- it's a, what I call human revolution. What do you mean by human revolution? The human revolution in our, in my Buddhist practice is the indication that you are transforming progressively the inner nature of who you are. If you have, you know, we all have, you know, uh, components of our lives uh, there's a theory in our practice of the 10 worlds, the, the mutual possession of the 10 worlds. Hell is one of those worlds. Anger is one of those. Greed is one of those. But also caring for others is one of those. And the Buddha, the Buddha nature in us. So they're all mutually possessed one in each other and they can manifest at any moment. You can change and switch. You can be super angry a second and then super relieved the next and be happy depending on what you hear on the phone as a phone call, it just stimulates you to react differently, right? Or respond, right? Um, so um, human revolution is the ongoing process of transforming yourself to be the better part of you, the more humanistic side of you, through time, through causes, through effects, through realization, through prayer, through introspection, through observation of your heart, and through interaction with others. You've you know, you, you won't change yourself by going in a mountain by yourself against trees. <laughs> you got to be interacting with people. People are your, uh, as a matter of fact, it's one of the four debts of gratitude in Buddhism is thank you to all people. Because without being uh, with people around me, I cannot achieve my Buddha nature. Because hmm. it's always, we always exist in relation to something else or someone else. We can only walk if there's a floor under the feet. <laughs> um, so you talk a, an awful lot about um, IQ, EQ, and TQ is something that uh, that I've heard you talk a, an awful lot about. It, talk to me a little bit about why you think these three things are so important. <clears throat> because they're the three components, the three aggregates that make up your ability to engage and do a good job. Uh, You necessarily have to have that attribute of intelligence, the ability to compose, to to, um, draft up, to express yourself correctly, verbally and in a written form, uh, vocally as well, using the voice. I've given a lot of podcasts on the voice and the power of our voice, our vocal voice, right? Because there's your written voice as well. You know, we Mm -hmm. can 
talk about that as a nuance. But your IQ, you write well, you, eat, you know, speak well. And then your EQ is what I call now, as a friend of mine told me, is power skills, your, your um, ability to engage, to truly understand who you really are and work on your transformation as a, a human connector to other humans and to have that exchange and, you know, of respect and, and uh, dialogue, a dialogic approach to life. Mm-hmm. And then TQ is the one that is now coming to the forefront even more so especially in this COVID period where we need to be able to understand the power of machine and man, not machine versus man. And to leverage the use of technology to be scalable in your uh, ability to perform a given task. There's a lot of tasks that we engage in doing that actually can be automated. Mm -hmm. You talk about sales, for instance, there's a lot of data that can be automated through tools. Where do you stand out in your empathetic, your communication, your you know, human engagement? And that is where you should be focusing your, your, um, your EQ should be taking over. And the TQ is that you know how to orchestrate all of the various technical, technological tools so that you can be scalable. You can you know, rise to perform at a higher level. Uh, with less drudgery and doing stuff, you know, the stuff that, stuff that you, you shouldn't have to do that some automation tool can do for you. Mm-hmm. So you're more on the phone, you're more in Zoom, you're more speaking and engaging with people and having real discussions about what's important to them in their company or so on. Well, it's, it's, it's changing the way sales is done. I mean, it used to be uh, smile and dial and, you know, just pick up the phone a hundred times a day and you'll get somebody on the phone and you'll drum up, drum up business. But now it's, um, it's, it's so much more about building connections and relationships than it was in the past. I think, what do you see as uh, some of the most important technologies coming out that is going to help people build their community and expand their relationships? Well, um, you know, there's the idea of personalization versus, you know, uh, you know, kind of um, automation that's not highly personalized all the time. So you have the homogenous messages and you have the hyperscale, the hyper personalized. You got to be wise in the use of those two extremes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that just addressing the commercial case, the viability of your commercial case for change with someone, bringing it up in a succinct way, but still, um, and, your, and the underlings or the belly of your approach, uh, people sense that you are a person that's confident, that's calm, that's relevant, that's mature, but you know that time is an essence of the person. You get to the point quickly, and you just want to get them to book or to commit to a 15-minute call later. Buying 15 minutes is not a lot. Trying to sell an hour and a half meat, that's probably a bit more contentious. Mm -hmm. So you got to be wise in the use of your tools. There are now trigger event monitoring tools. One of the big um, catalysts for change or for follow-up or for re-engaging with someone is knowing trigger events, uh, events where they change roles. You know, notifications in Navigator will tell you if someone, I get notifications of role changes all the time and it allows me to follow up on those people and say, hey, congratulations on your new position. I'm so happy for you. Like, and I look at the role and I say, it must be a positive move for him or her. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't have taken on for the most part, right? Uh, so you congratulate them and, you know, give them a path. Yesterday, I'm coaching a young rep. And his president finally connected with him because he did a, a big deal and he closed a big deal. And I said, tell me about this president. So now he wrote a book. So I said, oh, I, I want to connect with him too, right? And maybe we can help him with sales enablement for his other 10 reps. And I said, I've received a lot of praise. I heard a lot of praise about your book. Well, he connected with me right away <laughs> because he's ta- it's, I'm talking about him. I'm not talking mm-hmm. about me. Like he doesn't care who I am right now. He checked me out. He said, "Okay, your profile seems solid. Yeah, I'll connect with you because we had you know mutual connections." So it's about them. It's not about us, right? So trigger event is a great tool to know what's going on and 
and you can mobilize because when you think about it, if you check that person moving to another position, who's taking over his mm -hmm. previous one? And where does he or she come from? And with the person that is moving to a new position, who was replaced? Where did they go? So you can find four leads if you do enough due diligence and have four leads just on account of one move. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's kind of business intelligence. That's another tool, right? So there's a lot of good tools out there. You got to use them, bro. That's huge. That's huge. And not just for, for prospects, prospecting, but for job seekers too. That's a way to continue to build your relationship and become a, a more integral part of your community by continuing to stay in touch with people about their world. So the more interest you show in someone, the more interest they're going to show in you. Yeah. I mean, there's a, the, you know, there are people that feel very much uh, stressed and pained and suffering in the world of finding work because there's a lot of companies out there who don't take the time to respond. I think if there's one thing I would say to people who are in the in the business of recruiting or helping to displace and get people to move into other positions, at least write them a quick email that says, thank you for having come. Unfortunately, we filled the position. That is a huge, that I would, I would, and I'm not in that position because I've been self-employed for 30 odd years, but I know that they, I hear that a lot. Just, give me a sign of life to not that is so difficult people suffer there's so many su people suffering right now just give him a sign a quick email even if it's templated but says thank you for coming you know good luck maybe uh, you know keep in touch come back in a year six months whatever they get a sign of life solitude is a big uh, suffering um, uh, stimulus, right? It creates a lot of suffering, not showing people that hey, they took the time to do their, to send it to you. I don't know. I'm, I'm not in your business, so I can't understand, but I uh, would suffer so much if I didn't get, you know. The unknown is so much more painful than the known. It's, it, to sit there and wait and not hear anything is in, incredibly difficult. Uh, and it's, it's so much longer. The, the no is, is hard. It's painful. I understand. But it's quick. It happens. They said no. Hopefully they're, you're hearing no, not right now. But it's, it happens and it's done. You can reflect on it and you can move on. But the prolonged nothing is, is what sucks people's souls. Yeah, it really drains you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to switch to a to a happy topic a little bit. So you you are a master prospector. That is something that you specialize in. You coach uh, coach sales teams on on how to prospect. I want to hear about how you prospect. You gave me a a, a little bit with when you were talking about the triggering events, but I want to hear how a master prospector coaches people on prospecting prospects. Okay. Well, the first thing is why are you in this business of selling, like? What's your why, right? What's, what's all, what are you all about? So I always get to know the person a little bit, you know, what stimulates them, what's, what inspires them to be in this particular choice because we hear that a lot. People fall into sales because they can't do anything else. <laughs> and, you know, my, my, my dream and my goal is to inspire people to say, hey, we are proud to be in sales. We make the difference. We create the revenue, right? We, everybody else creates a cost when you think about it. And so I find a little bit about them. And once I know a little bit about that and what's important to them, then we say, okay, well, let's go look at your LinkedIn. What's, how's your LinkedIn profile? Because 75% of people are going to check you out mm -hmm. after you prospected. There are people visiting you now that are looking at your profile. And if you're not on the premium package, you don't know that they've come to visit you. That's an interesting piece of trigger mm -hmm. to find out. When I have people visiting me, I write back to them, thank you for passing by my profile and visiting me. How have you been? Often they don't answer. Some they do, right? But it shows them, hey, I'm aware that you came to see me, right? 
So let's make a more robust, more complete, more enriching experience for the visitor to come and check you out and say, oh, I get a good picture of who this person you know, most likely is. Uh, even your hobbies, your volunteer work in the community, all important. It gives you a round more full picture of who you are as a person. Uh, and then let's look at, I asked them to write down really detailed, fine tooth and comb details of the problems that you seriously resolve for your clients. Mm -hmm. Because in this economy, if you're not crystal clear on the problem you solve, there's a chance that you're not going to, you're not going to sell that product well. It's called product market fit. You know that big statement everybody talks about? Product market fit, blah, 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 you hear it. But it's got to be crystal clear to you what is it that you solve that's seriously important to the client. So, and I asked him, why did you choose to sell this versus that? Obviously, if you're an engineer and it's environmental intelligence and, you know, you're helping to, you know, monitor odor coming into a city because of your gold mine or your water dump, you know, waste like I have with clients, that's easy. It resolves a problem, a peaceful, better life for the CEO, for the <laughs> shareholders and for the community, right? Uh, so you got to ask that question. So I asked them to write it down. So next time we meet, I want you to be able to explain to me in finer details, written down, not spoken, write it down, think through it, send me the copy. And we'll discuss. Once you have that, then we start talking about these those skills of writing well and summarizing that and having a narrative that's really nailed, that's relevant to the different people in the organization that are most likely going to influence that decision. So that's what we call buyer persona creation. Like really have nailed narratives for those various different kinds of individuals. So that when you speak to the CFO, you talk the CFO language. Hmm. Yesterday, the rep I was coaching last night, he says, oh my goodness, they are, they are you know, a special number, these CFOs. I say, yeah, well, they think finance. Don't talk to them about features and functions or you know, marketing issues. They don't care. I mean, it's the last scene in Gone with the Wind they don't care, right? <laughs> they, talk, they want to talk about what they want that's important to them. The CEO wants another. He wants to save his job. <laughs> he wants to appear a good corporate citizen. He wants his shareholders to think highly of him. He wants to be down the middle of the road, good corporate citizen. Uh, the operations guy, he wants to know about KPIs and the, the, the salary. So you got to know those things. So we go through that and then and only then we start writing an email that makes sense to each individual and how you speak, what you say in those first few seconds, your integrity. That's after when the stuff, which is called the content, is well thought through. Mm -hmm. And with that good content, people get to know you. They get to know who you are, what you're about, and the value that you can bring to them before you even talk to them. Yeah, well, I talk a lot about voice because I know that in the first few seconds, especially C-suite, they're listening very carefully to whom they can trust. Hmm. The voice is the most neglected area of sales. Zig Ziglar 40 years ago talked about it. Probably he says the most neglected area to increase your closing percentages has to do with the use of your voice. This is verbatim what I'm saying. I have it here in a recording from his institute because I used to listen to him day in, day out uh, in the 80s in my cassette recorder in my car. <laughs> and those I, days. I, I love it. I wish I was in my, in my office right now. I've got an autographed copy of, of one of his, his tape sets. My, uh, my dad brought me to meet him at a book signing when I was eight and I have a wow letter. I have a letter from him signed personally wow I want you to at least take a photo and send it to me I would love to see it next time I am back in the office I it is it's on its way wonderful thank you yeah that, I love it I, I love, love, I love that man the integrity of that man Incredible. that's the number one thing he talks about is integrity and that's 
that's, I, we're right back to the beginning. And I think that's so important that without being a good person, it's almost impossible to be a great salesperson. It is almost impossible. Service, active service. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's actually the, I learned from a colleague that I admire in Australia. His name is John Smybert. And he interviewed me several times on his show. And um, I heard him say that the word sell comes from the word sellan, S E L L A N. You're typing too fast. Um, and sellan actually, in the, I think, Gaelic or Old English, means to. Uh, to give, to bestow, hmm. to provide something of that nature. So selling is actually a giving act. It's not a taking uh, mm-hmm. action. Well, Denis, thank you so much for giving us your time today. Uh, really, really appreciate it. There's a lot of, lot of info in there that I think could benefit a lot of people. Uh, any other last thoughts or ideas that you'd like to share, sir? Well, like I said all the time, you know, life is a journey and we're a student on the road. So stay uh, connected to learning. Uh, Always, you know, open your heart and your mind to learning new things. And uh, learners, uh, as I say, are earners. Love it. Uh, Denis, if somebody is interested in contacting you, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Uh, LinkedIn is usually the place to the go to, uh, Denis, D E N I S, and Champagne like the wine, C H A M P A G N E, or uh, Lotuscom, L O T U S C O M M dot com for Lotus Communications, my company. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best place. You know, I'm, I'm always there, I'm exchanging. I had the pleasure of meeting you on LinkedIn, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. And and now here we are. So again, Denis, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to uh, build on the relationship that we've established. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Travis. All the best to you. I'm making a move. on me